because yeah. so much work's been done in this field over time, whether we go back 10 years to Project Aristotle and Project Oxygen, the amount of waste that occurs in the world because leadership isn't sometimes what it could be. I just can't wait to hear um, Giselle's talk about this. So you, but you're doing the intros, I've stolen them. Yeah. <laughs> So we're very happy to welcome Giselle Machado. She goes by pronouns she, aha. Uh, and she started her uh, career as a technologist when she was an adolescent. So which means over years, she has played different roles as like data analyst, systems analyst, a lecturer, a researcher, and of course, a programmer. And during this time, she also got opportunities to work with different kinds of people, different styles, different leadership styles, and you know, different cultures. So Giselle is here today to share her personal journey of accidentally getting to play a technology leadership role when there is a need. And we are all waiting to hear your experiences, Giselle. So I will start with this. Years ago, following my dad's example, I decided to become a software engineer, a software developer, something in the 90s. Since then, I've been working in many different areas, many different environments and companies. One of these companies were the Army, where I could find a very hierarchical way of working. I also experienced a more flexible environment, where I had more autonomy as a new startup. I also experienced things that were challenging. So as Kira just introduced it, I tried data researching, business analysts, design, and so on. But when I moved into Australia in 2017, I decided to keep it within development just because I found here a very specialist market. But Giselle, what all this has to do with leadership? Most of the places that I work with, I found poor or missing leadership. So this picture shows me with a very influential person that is the vice president of Brazil. I had the pleasure of working with him. When listen words like army, you could think in, you know, could sound in many ways. You could think about punishment, discipline, hierarchy, and so on. For me, army means experience, family, and leadership. Leadership in the army is just a process of motivating people, give them purpose, and we usually want to achieve a mission. Leadership for me, it's, you know, when authentic leadership for me, it's about building trust and taking responsibility. As a consultant, you used to change projects, companies, lots of different scopes and stocks. This environment can sound a little tricky if you are not a dynamic person and easy to adapt. So picture this, you are a senior developer just joining a new team that having been running for a while, and you found them struggling to do things like have their own way of working or implementing good practices engineers such as TDD or pairing, and they want to have more autonomy to release and so many things. They want to pair more. How they do that? How would you do that? Do you think it's possible, you know, with this COVID scenario where more, most of the people just work from home, how, can they, how could them influence people? How could them lead without being seen, without having a role title as a tech lead or a you know, principal or so on? Do you think it's possible? In my opinion, it's possible, and I've done that. I just step in a position. I know that I have experience, but I wasn't the tech lead. And today I'm going to share with you how I've done that. But basically, I have been observing, taking notes, and talking. OK, Giselle, so you're stepping in a new team. You are a, a lead developer, yeah, but in this team, I was just a senior developer that wore my, my role. And when I just started, they told me, OK, you can't pair here. The culture of the company is not aligning with pairing. Um, also, they don't do bugs estimation. I say, OK, but you show that our team is fixing bugs in some way. How do you show and play visibility, right? How do you show the team performance? How do you show that we are fixing bugs? 
and they said, okay, that's a big question. No one sh could answer my questions in my team. They also told me that, you know, the head of the company, because it's, it's a very hierarchical company, they have structure there, approves, etc. things, documentations. They told me that they expect most of the teams have the same average performance. That is the moment that my mind just blew. Okay, we are having different teams working different technologies, having different knowledge, different size, so teams with four, teams with six people, and you expect they perform the same. How do you think that's possible? It sounds so distant for me. I started to think, okay, I'm observing this and that, and I create a hypothesis. My hypothesis is simple. I don't believe that's only myself saying this is an issue. There is something wrong here. What I'm going to do with this? I'm observing, I took my notes, and I decide to prove my hypothesis. I think people just don't know who they should talk to or how they talk about that. My first two weeks in this environment was I was able to pair as much as I, it's possible because I was rotating another developer. So I was replacing this developer in this team. So I have two weeks of pairing. I took this opportunity to show them that pairing is good. First of all, I pair with everyone, not just the person that was doing development straight away. They was rotating. And yeah, Giselle, but Pairing, what's pairing? What, it's, what are you talking about? So I put this tree here that represents pairing, where fruits are um, the team effectiveness when pairing, leaf represents the respect, listen and focus, the branch is the drive and navigator ping pong, so when we are pairing, we have one code base, one task, and we together have to solve this, so we change the same code at the same time. So one time, one person is coding, another time is the other person coding, and one is saying, okay, maybe we could try that, or maybe we could change that line, or this column is missing at the line, right? And the root, root is the core, right? Is the what sustain everything, is the knowledge that we are sharing, is the knowledge that we, the, that we are transferring, is the skills improvement during this pairing. So, okay, Giselle, we are talking about pairing, looks beautiful, nice. But pairing is controversial. Not everyone feels comfortable about pairing. And most, we have many reasons for that, but I will share with you one. So when I was pairing, people feel not comfortable of being wrong. They don't like to show they are vulnerable. I'm, I don't like to show that I don't know something, I don't feel comfortable with. So I took this, and instead of show them the, okay, I know everything because I have more than 20 years in the role, and I have this beautiful lead title, or a senior title, lots of experience. I don't want to scare the other developers, the, you know, the junior ones or any other type of developer. So instead of saying that I know things, doesn't matter if I know or not, I just say, I don't know. I'm wrong with that. I just highlight it. Because by doing that, I give them the opportunity to correct me. You know, I open doors so they can talk to me in a more freely way, and we can have the same level of conversation, showing that I'm also wrong, that I'm also vulnerable. I could, sh could give them opportunity to fix things, you know, and we could grow together. But Talking to people, right, I just proved my hypothesis. I could say, okay, I pray with everyone in my team, I took notes about everything, and we together have an opinion. And that opinion is, that's something wrong. It's not me that was thinking about that. Then I took to the next level, I talked to my tech lead. And he was just rotating another tech lead. This new person in the team, totally disagree with my opinion. And that agreement gives me uh, freedom to take to the other next level because it's a hierarchical company. So I start to talk across teams. I start to pair to people to other teams. 
And after that, I also start to talk to people that are the head of engineers and so on. So I give this, I, I receive that freedom just being a senior developer in my team. So I start to talk across teams. Uh, I am, the first thing that I took responsibility with was figure out why they don't estimate bugs. I just would like to know the historical thing behind this. And if they don't do that, OK, how can I show that we are fixing bugs in my team? And starting to ask questions to people that were longer in this company give me more than, than I had, you know, more than enough. So I can build a theory behind that. And also, in the side, side effect of this, I start to gain trust across the company. And I collected enough. Now was time to talk. So everything that I'm talking here looks like a beautiful story, right? Like you tell your kids when they go to bed. But it's not simple. Not all minds are easy to change. Not every mindset is the same. So what do you do when someone just say, I disagree with you. I think that's not right. What are you going to do? So what I did, first of all, was be really careful and attentive to the tales. And I tried to map people personalities. I have like my scripts for each person that I recognize. So I say, OK, that person looks a little reactive. I want to approach like that. I, I need to be a little bit careful when talk to this person. Um, and also, I start to talk if I, they are not easy to talk one on one. I start to raise my hand during meetings with this person in there and talk in public, right? Talking in public it gave me also more visibility. Raise your hand is something really important when you are in meetings, when you have opinion and you have something to share. OK, but if you are not in the meeting that people talk about this. If I'm not in the meeting, I, my first action is questioning, can I be in this meeting? So I can share my opinion. And if someone says no, yeah, I receive plenty of no's, I say, OK, can you talk about that in this meeting for me? And if this person is not there, so it's escalated, right? You go to the next and the next till you get your point in the meeting that should be. Don't be afraid of talking. It's really powerful. Cool, Giselle, but I have an intrinsic personality. I'm not an extrovert. What am I going to do? So not everyone, mainly developers, usually to be really intrinsic, right? They don't like to talk too much. And we have this awkward silence during all stand-ups, so really interesting thing. Um, what do you do? So I suggest during a retrospective, can we have an workshop to understand a little bit about each other? That they accepted that, and then we have an workshop to talk a little bit about each other. Really informal. So we design a canvas where we put things like, uh, when you see me like this, it means uh, to you know you have to work with me, just my colleagues know, right? Um, also, I, me at life, who I am when I'm my own life. Me at work, I really like set silence. What I most value, right? What is the most valuable thing in a colleague for me? This type of conversation gives us so much and rich knowledge about each other that we figure out, for example, our, our limits when talk to someone. We figure out where we should go, the maximum that you can achieve to, when talking to someone, knowing limits and being more respectful when talking. And it was really powerful to know about each other, really rich and give us a really vision about the team diversity that was really amusing. OK, so let's review a little bit my narrative. I've been talking about raise my hand, talking, understand about each other, figure out about issues that we have in the company. What all this is, is mostly about taking responsibility. After all, with great power, comes great responsibility. So it's not just raise your hand, have your opinions, and go aware and talk about what you think. 
It's you have to understand what are you talking about. You have to be confident enough and understand what's the issue and what's the goal. Um, so in the case of the bugs estimation, my, my main goal there was, okay, I would like to show more, uh, show, improve the visibility of my team work, you know, because we are performing, we are a higher performers, but they are not having visibility about that. I also have to understand about bugs estimation. What is that? So we have a sprint, we have our cards, our tasks to do, and most of them have a wave. And that wave means not time, because we don't like about timing things. We like the effort of, you know, finish a task. It could be one story point, two story point, three, and so on, like the Fibonacci. But not everyone agrees about one means. What one means for you? What number two means for you? So during the estimation process, we have someone just putting eight, another one just putting three. And okay, <laughs> it's something wrong here. It's not only about bugs. It's, we saw a, a high level of issue in the processing, in the, in the estimation process. So I also, during a retrospective, just put, okay, can we just talk about this estimation thing? I'm not 100% confident about when I should put a three or five. Okay, and I also ask for help in doing this process. I ask my, um, my colleague that is a business analyst to set up a workshop and in together we run a workshop and just to talk about estimation. The result of this workshopping was a really nice confluence page where we have lots of samples, what one means, and we define little bullet points about what it is, one point, two points, three points, and so on. Um, documentation is really powerful, and the result of this estimation wasn't just for us. Other teams also find it useful, and new developers that just joined the team also like that, and it was easier for us to explain things after that. Okay, if you, another tip is if you not, can't solve things immediately, just set up follow-ups. So you can ask things like, okay, can we talk about this again on Monday? Or when is the best time to, so we can review that? After some point, so I started to see things just growing. We started to influence other teams. We started to uh, invite them to take parties, workshops, and discussions. So sometimes we need some card to be um, solved, and we need extra help because we don't know about something. We start to ask the backend team, so is this feature already ready? We don't know. OK, when's going to be in your sprint? So we can combine all these. We can balance all these. So we start to talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, ad hoc conversations, parties, and things. And then also the moment that we sell something like, OK, do you think bugs estimation is important? Or do you think, you know, talk about this and that is also good for your team? Um, sharing this knowledge was also important for us. So when I work with, as a front-end uh, developer in this team, I found a solution for a thing that was, you know, a a task that was blocking a market to receive a new application. And instead of just, OK, fix, taking my card and putting the done, I just share what I've done. I talk to the mobile team. I talk to the backend team. Hey, I solved this. I think you're going to need to. That's the card number X, Y, Z. And that's the document that I you know, set up when I was doing a spike. So maybe this could help, help you too. And my findings were also, you know, I received feedbacks that also gave me opportunity to improve my own work and unblock this uh, task and receiving this new feature in the new market. New ways of working. So by doing this thing, the head of engineer just create a meeting so all tech leads and myself could share opinions about what how, ways, new ways of working cross teams. So they want to create new standards so they can share cross company. And guess what? I was the first one talking in this meeting. Coincidence or not, I think it was created for me. You know, I talk it a lot. 
The result of this was I could share the new refactoring that we have done. So my team and I, we study all the tech tabs, we study all the things that we would like to implement, always doing TDD, et cetera. And we, at the result of that, we have lots of nice confluence, confluence pages and roadmaps to improve the code quality. And one of them was a repository, the front-end one, that we redesigned uh, the folder structure, and we share that idea with other ones. Why, Giselle? Because we want to reduce the cross-work, so measure requests that we had lots of um, problem when merging, so that was improved. Finally, I figured out that I would start to get noticed. So I was the first one to share in this meeting. I was also the one that shared uh, workshops and stack parties, and we create documentations that are also using cross teams. And we start to be a model. Do we start to be noticed? And I really had my highlight that I got noticed when during a meeting, just a person said, oh, I've discussed this problem with Giselle, and we think this could work. So that really my highlight saying, yes, I've done that. We got notice. As a result, so as a consulting, uh, I could just say I was hired to be a lead. I just want to be a tech lead all the time, right? But instead of doing that, I just decide, OK, I'm going to be here, and I'm going to use all my talent, everything that I could, to improve all the issues that I can using all my knowledge. And I've done that, and I help many of them just by doing that. I also thought you know, that in I decide to not ask to rotating. I keep it with my team. I use all my expertise that I, you know, that I had at that moment. And at the end, we were always pairing. We were always doing TDD. We estimate bugs. And we estimate much better than we were in the beginning for every card. We had autonomy to manage our own backlog. We were models, we were pioneers, the first team to become a product team. Instead of working horizontally, we start to be full stacks working uh, vertically. And we innovate and had a strong impact. Thank you. <laughs>